tonight on KQED Newsroom. It's been one year since the pandemic began sweeping across the Golden State. UCSF experts Dr. Bob Wachter and Dr. Monica Gandhi discuss where we've been and where we're going. And Kara Golden, CEO of Hint Water, joins us to discuss women in business and her efforts to improve water quality in the state and the nation. Plus, we show you the views that come with hiking the trails at Tilden Park for this week's look at something beautiful. Welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Priya David Clemens. One year ago, our lives were turned upside down. Shelter in place orders went into effect, shutting down businesses and schools. Now, as vaccines stream into the state, we are seeing an end in sight. California's coronavirus map is rapidly shifting colors, from lots of purple for counties in widespread risk tiers to red for the milder substantial risk tiers, with pops of orange for moderate risk. Even yellow for minimal risk is showing up. After a rocky start, the state has now provided almost 11 million vaccinations. In Tuesday's delayed State of the State address, Governor Gavin Newsom touted California's progress. Today we have the most robust vaccination program in the country. Think about this. California now ranks sixth in the world for vaccination distribution, ahead of countries, not states, ahead of countries like Russia, Germany, Israel, and France. This news still comes on the heels of a heavy toll. Over the past year, more than half a million Americans have died of the virus, nearly 55,000 of them Californians. Our first guests this evening are here to take stock of the year that has passed, the missteps and triumphs, and to help us assess what's ahead as we transition back to an open society. Joining us now via Skype is Dr. Robert Wachter, Chair of the Department of Medicine at UC San Francisco. Hello, Dr. Wachter. Hi, Priya. As Thanks well as Dr. Monica Gandhi, infectious disease doctor and professor of medicine also at UC San Francisco. Hello, Dr. Gandhi. Hi. Dr. Gandhi, let's begin with a concern over the variants. Are you worried about the virus changing so dramatically into a version that can't be managed by the vaccines we currently have? I am not worried about that for the variants. Um, for one thing, actually, just from our knowledge of HIV, uh, you can't mutate yourself too much. A <laughs> virus can't do that. Coronaviruses actually have a very strong proofreading mechanism. So it looks like they're changing, but it's not changing that fast, um, like influenza does every year. And then the third reason is, I think we're looking at antibodies a lot as our main immune response for viruses, but they're not. It's actually cell-mediated immunity, or T cells, that help us fight variants and viruses. And there was this incredible paper from um, uh, San Diego last week that if you look at T cell responses to vaccines, they all work perfectly well against all the variants, so-called variants, South Africa, Brazil, UK, California. So our T cell response is gonna get us out of this. We're gonna have long-standing immune responses against the variants. And Dr. Walker, would you agree with that? And could you tell us a little bit about, now that the infection rate is dropping here in California, when you think businesses will be able to fully reopen safely? Well, since I learned most of my uh, infectious disease from Monica, I completely agree with that. The, uh, the variants have become, I think, a little bit less scary in the last few weeks. We've seen that the variants, even from South Africa and Brazil, appear to be uh, somewhat responsive to the vaccines. The main variant in the United States is becoming the UK variant. And if you look at the infection rates in the UK, they are plummeting actually slightly faster than they're coming down in the United States. So. Anything can happen with this virus, but uh, I think we're in a pretty good place. Uh, you know, it looks like the rate that we're improving and the rate of vaccinations are such that we should be getting back to a level of normalcy by May or so. I mean, it really looks like we've have a couple of months before we get to levels of immunity that should be consistent with people going back to something that pretty closely resembles normal life. Part of that is going to include schools reopening. And I want to talk, Dr. Gandhi, about an op-ed that you co-authored in the USA Today just a few days ago. And in that, you wrote, keeping schools closed or even partially closed based on what we now know is unwarranted, harming children, and has become a human rights issue. Can you elaborate on that? I mean, some of the concern has not been so much about transmission between children, but professional adults going back into the workplace before they're fully vaccinated. Is that not a valid concern? 
You know, there are four reasons why we wrote that article and why we think what I just said, that it's a human rights issue. Number one is that children um, are much, much less at risk for severe disease than adults. As you know, 288 deaths among children from COVID-19 in the United States since the beginning of the pandemic, as opposed to 525,000 deaths in adults. There's no comparison. It does not occur in children, thank God. Um, like it, those rates of 288 is similar to influenza deaths from two years ago in children. So um, luckily this is a population that's spared. There's a Lancet article that showed this across the entire planet that, that children are spared from severe illness. Second reason, there are increasing rates of mental illness, depression, mm -hmm. anxiety, gaining weight, diabetes in children because of prolonged school closures. That data actually comes out of, out of UCSF, out of the emergency department, um, with increased rates of suicidal ideation presenting to the emergency room in adolescents. Third is that we have data on safety for teachers and staff really great data published in the CDC uh, journal MMWR about how to keep teachers and staff safe, even though actually I do believe they should get vaccinated uh, before they go back to school because they deserve all the, uh, the reduced anxiety that we have as healthcare workers after a vast vaccinated and indeed they are getting vaccinated that is a priority of the biden administration and of the state um, and then fourth going back to the variants right variants are not a reason to keep schools closed they're not radioactive we know how to block transmission to variants just like we do uh, the ancestral virus and importantly our vaccines will protect us I want to go back and review a little bit of this past year because we are one year from the date that the WHO declared the pandemic a, a global emergency, a global problem. And in that year, we have come through some victories and some problems. We've learned a lot along the way. Dr. Wachter, you've been on the show before and you have praised the success of Operation Warp Speed and bringing us a vaccine. Would you outline for us what you see as the critical victories and the points in which we did not do so well over this past year? Well, we don't have time to go through all the things we did not do well. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's almost everything else. It is, uh, it, it, when the pandemic hit, there should have been a unified response, a strong CDC coming out with the kinds of recommendations that we're now seeing. We're seeing what that would have looked like with clear, consistent recommendations about what we should and shouldn't be doing. We would have had presidential leadership that would have brought us all together to fight a common foe. We would have been supporting international organizations. Uh, we would have had consistent messaging on things like masks. We would have had a uh, Manhattan Project-like effort to get testing and PPE out there. So we get an F on almost all of that. Um, Operation Warp Speed is different. Operation Warp Speed was a uh, an effort by the Trump administration to catalyze rapid development of vaccines. They basically gave the companies the support they needed to take the risk out of the process and then left them alone. So that's exactly what they needed to have done. And they did it. Uh, the companies, based on a whole lot of research that's been done for, uh, for decades, uh, came out with miraculously effective vaccines in about 10 months. It's hard to imagine having done better than that. Then they kind of botched the, the rollout and we weren't prepared to then take these vaccines and get them into the arms of people. That has taken some, some new work that had to happen over the last couple of months. But I find very little to be critical about the vaccine process. And if, you know, I spoke to a lot of vaccine and epidemiology and virology experts in, in March of 2020 and asked them when, I, when they thought they'd be a vaccine. Some of them said never. Some of them said by the middle of 2021, none of them said by October, November of 2020. So I think credit has to go where credit is due. And on this one, they got it right. And Dr. Gandhi, I see you nodding along there. Anything you'd like to add? You know, um, ever since November 9th, which is when the first uh, press release came out of the Pfizer vaccine with a quick succession of many other vaccines, I've literally, literally been jumping up and down every day. I cannot believe the efficacy of these vaccines against severe disease. I cannot believe that they got developed so fast. I'm so excited 
And we are seeing this happen. We are watching this happen in front of our very eyes. Nursing homes is what really impresses me, what's going on right now in this country, that because we mass vaccinated nursing homes first, as we should, uh, you're seeing the death rate and hospitalizations plummet in that population, even in the context of lockdown. It has nothing to do with restrictions in nursing homes. These vaccines work so well. We are going to get through this pandemic. And let's talk a little bit about the concerns around the most recent vaccine to roll out, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. There have been people who've worried that it is not as uh, efficacious as the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccines. What, what would you say to that, Dr. Gandhi? You know, there are six reasons <laughs> I like the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. I'm going to say them really fast. Your reasons are getting um, longer as we go. <laughs> <laughs> One is that um, actually the efficacy against severe disease um, was equal to with the Moderna and Pfizer. So meaning any hospitalization and death that occurred in this huge 43,000 person trial, it occurred in people who got the salt shot not in anyone who got the vaccine. You did not go to the hospital or get sick from COVID to that degree if you got the vaccine. Second is that when you look at the phase one trial data, the antibodies keep on going up, up over time. I see this as the gift that keeps on giving. I actually think we're gonna have more protection from the Johnson Johnson vaccine after the short period of time that they looked at in the phase three trial. So it's gonna keep on giving. Number three, one dose um, that's easier to give. We're gonna get it out faster. We're gonna get to herd immunity faster. Your immunity is my immunity. So all of that's gonna happen faster. Fourth, AstraZeneca is its cousin in UK. It's kind of the same vaccine. They're rolling it out fast. And the, the death rate from hospitalizations is at equal to the mRNA vaccine. It's 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 in real world, it's playing out that it's working incredibly well. Fourth, <laughs> fifth, two more. It works against the variants, um, and it's been studied against the variants, and it works uh, just as well against the variants. The mRNA vaccines weren't studied at a time the variants were circulating. And last, it was a very diverse trial, and I like trials that look like people um, that you're serving. So it was a very diverse trial in terms of a lot of Latinx participants, African and African Americans, um, and I like that aspect of it as well. Well, thank you for all of that detail. That really, I think, should set a lot of people's minds at ease about taking the J&J &J vaccine. Uh, Dr. Wachter, President Biden has said his goal is to make vaccinations available to all adults starting May 1st. And the issue seems to be supply at this point rather than distribution. Can you talk us through some of the intricacies of the supply? What's going on here? Do we not have enough raw materials? Is it the production timeline or some other problem? Mostly production. This is really hard to do. It's it's not like repurposing a General Motors plant to produce uh, ventilators or <clears throat> or a clothing plant to produce masks or or PP. It's very sophisticated. It is painstaking. There has to be a lot of quality control. You cannot afford any possibility of an error. And so the fact that we're now vaccinating today nearly three million people got vaccinated today mm. is uh is remarkable it's almost hard to imagine it can go any faster the fact that the j and j now enters the mix means that we now have the production of three different vaccines merck the fifth or sixth biggest pharmaceutical company in the country uh its vaccines uh did not work but now merck is helping manufacture the other vaccines so they're putting their shoulder to it. And I think this is about as fast as we can uh, we can imagine. I mean, 3 million vaccine doses administered a day is tremendous. January was a disaster. It, you know, the rollout was botched. We didn't understand the complexity. There had been very little planning for the rollout. But over the last uh, month or so, I think it's pretty impressive. And it'll get even more impressive as it rolls out into your local uh, pharmaceutical offices, it rolls out into doctor's offices. Right now, it's still mostly big hospitals, health departments, and football stadiums. Uh, as we distribute the vaccines even more broadly, I think you're going to see in a couple of months that it will be just like the way you get flu vaccine. It'll be much, much easier. And Dr. Gandhi, talk to us about the behaviors we can engage in once we're vaccinated. There does seem to be this concern that once you're vaccinated, you still can pass on the virus. Is that accurate? And what sort of behaviors should we be engaging in at that point? You know, this idea that vaccines don't block transmission is very December 2020, is how I put it, because that was the data that came out of the clinical trials because they weren't designed to look if they block transmission. We now have lots and lots of real world data that shows that vaccines massively reduce asymptomatic infection and transmission. One paper just from today that vaccines produce high levels of IgA, which is the immunoglobulin that gets in your nose and stops you from um, 
getting it in your nose and passing it on. And then multiple studies, including one yesterday from the Mayo Clinic, that they swab everyone after vaccination because you can't have surgery, for example, uh, in a hospital before swabbing, an 80% reduction in transmission, paper after paper. So I'm quite secure that vaccines reduce transmission massively. And I think that did play into the CDC guidelines the other day that said vaccinated people can be around vaccinated people without trouble, no issues. Um, and then uh, vaccinated people can be around unvaccinated people as long as that unvaccinated person is not susceptible to severe disease. This paves the way for our grandparents to visit our grandchildren and hug them because they are not as susceptible as we talked about before. And Dr. Wachter, last question to you as we go here. It seems one of the positive sides of this pandemic has been mask wearing in that it has brought down the rates of infectious illness in other diseases such as the flu. Do you think mask wearing will become something of a cultural norm? Well, it certainly has in Asia. If you go to Hong Kong or you go into Japan and you'll see, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20% of the people wearing masks crossing the street or on the subway. I think it's to be interesting. I, I, I imagine it will for a year or two. I mean, for me personally, the idea of going into a crowded bar, uh, standing shoulder to shoulder with people without masks may feel weird for a while. And uh, it won't surprise me if, if, if we continue to wear masks for a while. Two to three years from now, I don't know. I kind of doubt it, uh, but I think we'll have to see. There's no question, you know, everybody's worried about this double uh, epidemic of flu and COVID, and the flu rate went down to essentially zero. Thank you so much, Dr. Robert Wachter and Dr. Monica Gandhi, both from UCSF. Thank, Thank you. you. A year of pandemic has significantly impacted businesses and not least women in business. But CEO and founder Kara Golden says her company, Hint Water, has been able to thrive despite COVID-19. And she's got advice to offer other entrepreneurs. Golden is also teaming up with California Congress member Jackie Spear to improve the quality of our drinking water and keep carcinogenic chemicals out of our water supply. We want to note that Hint is a sponsor of a KQED radio show, The California Report. Their support had no bearing on this booking, but we felt it's important to disclose for full transparency. Joining me now is Kara Golden, CEO and founder of Hint Water. She joins us from Ross by Skype. Hi, Kara. Hi. So in 2011, Fortune magazine named you one of the most powerful women entrepreneurs, and you've been growing ever since. So tell us about Hint Water, which I know is a fruit flavored water, but how did you build a $150 million company out of squeezing fruit into water? Yeah, so I, I was a tech executive and really realized after leaving my uh, last role as a uh, head of e-commerce partnerships for America Online that I really needed to take a break and focus on my health. Uh, I had three kids under the age of four, um, had gained a chunk of weight over the course of a few years, uh, but also had developed some terrible adult acne and energy levels were decreasing. And that's when I really started looking at what I was eating as a solution to kind of clear up some of these issues. I had almost given up when I looked at my drink, uh, my diet soda, and that's when I really realized that there were a lot of chemicals in this drink that I was putting in my body that I wasn't sure that I should. And this was over 15 years ago. I think for, for me, uh, diet meant health. It didn't, I wasn't drinking full-fledged sugar soda and when I swapped out my diet soda just for plain drinking water, I knew that I was getting healthier. I ended up losing the weight that I wanted to. My skin cleared up, my energy levels came back. But what I didn't realize was, was that water was so boring. And I hmm. knew I was supposed to be drinking water uh, for years, but I just wasn't. And so I started slicing up fruit and throwing in the water and, and that was where it really began. And now that product is not only at Whole Foods, but at retailers across the nation. And also you have a strong direct-to-consumer business through Amazon. I want to turn a little bit to the place of women in business these days. It is Women's History Month. And when it comes to business, we have a lot to celebrate because equality has certainly grown. So the wage gap between men and women has shrunk. Here in California, women earn 89% of what men earn after many years of attention to the wage gap. But there is still a gap. So does that concern you? 
of course it concerns me. I mean, I think that being a woman CEO, there aren't very many of us. And uh, and overall, I think that, you know, clearly the wages are are lower. And in a time when uh, we see so many women who are not opting out, I really believe being forced out because oftentimes they are making less money to care for kids who are being homeschooled uh, through the pandemic. There's all kinds of issues with it. But I think more than anything, looking at looking forward and and still focusing on how we can improve wages for women, but also realize that maybe this is a time for so many to actually realize what they really want to be doing, whether that's starting a company, uh, being an entrepreneur or not being an entrepreneur, everybody's got ideas and maybe there's something out there that you should actually be doing in your journey. What about you? Did you face gender discrimination, pay discrimination over the years in your career? You know, it's always hard to say, right? Because you're, uh, you're, I, I'm clearly was, was moving up um, throughout my career and but and I've never been a man so I'm not I'm not really really sure but I think more you, than anything did you ever learn you were paid less than a man who was doing a similar job I never knew that I was hmm. so uh, so but again my focus has always been to keep moving forward and keep figuring out what I can do and not to forget about those things but to figure out how do I actually Keep moving forward because I think that there, it, it's definitely important to fight the fight, but it's also important to figure out what you can actually take control of right now. So let's turn to your book, Undaunted, in which you share some of those hard-won life lessons. What would be your core number one takeaway from your book? I think just go try. Right, so many people along the same lines about of what we were just talking about. So many people are blocked by this fear of not being able to do something or it's not fair or anything else. They don't have the right experience. They, they might fail. I, I think a number of people, particularly women, fear failure. And I think that that is the number one thing that I want people to get out of the book that, you know, I definitely had fears. I definitely had failures. And, and most entrepreneurs do. And we don't necessarily hear about them all, but the key thing is, is to keep trying and learning from maybe those challenges, maybe those failures along the way. And, you know, in, in, in the case of the pandemic, I mean, that that is hopefully behind us. We're getting out of, of the, the woods. And, and I think more than anything, just focusing on what can we do and constantly focusing on uh, making it better. What's, making life better. What's your message then to those who are just struggling to make it through the end of this pandemic? I think that the number one thing, again, is figuring out how do you get yourself to really understand what's going to make you happy and and focus on things that that are really in in your heart, not what other people think that you should do. I mean, I think that the number one thing that I found in starting my company is that I hear from consumers every day that we're helping them, whether it's helping them drink water, helping them uh, control their type 2 diabetes, helping them get through breast cancer chemotherapy by masking the metallic taste that you get when you're going through chemo. And I'll tell you, if you can run a company or work for a company that is helping people or even a nonprofit that's helping people, that's a powerful thing, right? It starts to really uh, get you up in the morning and it really starts to, to make you feel like you're contributing and you're doing something that really is making a, a difference. And being, when I started a company 15 years ago, they, they didn't call companies like mine purpose-driven or mission-driven companies, but it, it's a really, really powerful thing to be able to help people. So, Kara, your work with your company has vastly increased your knowledge about drinking water in America, and you now have concerns about our water supply. Can you outline some of those concerns for us? Well, just from producing our product over the last 15 years, I've noticed that the water quality varies greatly in 
lots of different states. And so for, for me, it just really raised the question as a consumer, uh, how many consumers actually know what really is in their water supply and what are some of the regulations around it? And so I uh, had reached out to Congresswoman Jackie Spear on uh, another issue and uh, just asked her, who would I talk to about this at the national level? And that's when the two of us uh, got together and, and had uh, some more conversations on, on this topic. And we're hoping to actually, with the new presidency, bring this a little bit further and, and to be continued. What, what changes would you like to see? I would like to see that the uh, uh, there's one substance in particular that is considered a known carcinogen by the NIH and by the Center for Disease Control, which is called PFAS, a P-F-A-S. And uh, it, is, uh, it, it is not a good substance that is in a lot of the water supplies. And unfortunately, it is not removed from many of the water supplies and not regulated. Uh, either. So uh, I would like to see it actually considered a dangerous substance at the EPA level so that it is there are regulations uh, around exactly what can and cannot be in the water at any level. All right. CEO of Hint Water, Kara Golden. Kara, thanks for your time. Thank you. And we head now to the East Bay's Tilden Park. The Ohlone Indians lived on this land until ranching took over. In 1936, the land, then known as Upper Wildcat Canyon, became a public park. And it's this week's look at something beautiful. I'm Priya David Clemens. You can reach me on Twitter at Priya D. Clemens. You can find more of our news coverage at kqed.org slash newsroom. From all of us here at KQED Newsroom, thank you for joining us. Good night.